When you think of the word church, what's the definition that comes to your mind? If someone were to ask you, how do you define the church, what would you say? What do you think it means to be a member of the church? What does it mean to be part of this body? I mean, have, we ever, have you ever really stopped to think hard about that? It's a, it's a word we use often. We say, we're going to church. I'm part of First Free Church. But what does it mean? And is it possible that it's a word that we have so overused, sometimes even misused, and defined poorly? I mean, imagine with me for a second that you are an outsider, unfamiliar with Christianity, that you didn't know their beliefs and practices, and you decided to visit a few Sunday gatherings at different types of churches. What do you think you would walk away thinking church was all about? So imagine that you visited church number one. We'll just call it church number one. And after visiting church number one, you might think that church is all about being trendy, hipster, and cool. Church was all about being relevant to your audience. And you could tell this through the pastor's message on seven ways to be happy seven days a week. And you might also think that church is about enjoying a good show, complete with a trendy video, a hipster rock band, and a cool espresso bar. Or maybe after visiting church too, as an outsider, you might walk away thinking that Church is all about following the traditions and rituals of the dark ages. Church is all about being serious and somber and wearing clothes that match the mood. Church is about singing songs written by dead people in minor keys. Church is about following a strict order of service that you can never diverge from, lest you're liberal or progressive. Or maybe after visiting Church 3 as an outsider, you walk away being filled with fond memories of your trips to Burger King because like there, you can have it your way. Because there's a class for everyone and a worship service to fit everyone's preference. This church makes you think that the individual's experience is primary. Whether it's your children's individual experience in room 601 for the Kids Crazy for Christ program, or your high school's individual experience in room 501 at the High Schoolers High on Jesus program, or even your individual experience in room 401 at Soaked in Scripture Sunday School track number 7, which is connected to tracks 1 through 6 that meet every night of the week except on Sundays. So these churches are obviously exaggerated to a degree. But my point is that, is it possible that as a Bible-believing culture, we have elevated Americanized ways of doing church that actually tend to distract and diminish what the Bible talks about when it defines a church? I mean, if you read the Bible, does it ever centralize a physical building or musical performances or between-service amenities? or endless programs, as if the church were meant to be like an old country buffet for hungry religious people? As neutral and innocent as some of these things may be, and they are neutral and innocent depending on how we use them, they sometimes tend to distract us from what the Bible focuses on when it talks about the church. And it's my contention that when the Bible defines who the church is, it focuses on three things, a people, a purpose, and a person. And the Bible puts these three elements of the church together in the following way. The church is a people created for a purpose by a person. A people created for a purpose by a person. It's that simple, yet that profound. And it's my aim this morning not to try and bash the church and fix a bunch of problems, but rather I want to dig into God's word from 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 and paint a picture for us of what the church is what it means to be a part of it, and what the church ultimately exists for. So by way of setting the context, it's important to note that 1 Peter is a letter written to believers who are part of local churches in what was then known as Asia Minor and is now called modern-day Turkey. And the aim of Peter's letter, writing to these believers of local churches, is summed up in his aim to answer this question. What does it mean to be Christ's church amongst the Christless world. And in chapter 2 specifically, Peter focuses on what it means to be part of this community and church that God is building through his son Jesus. Specifically in verses 9 and 10 that we're going to look at, Peter relays to us as believers our new identity as God's church, our ultimate purpose, and the grace and mercy that made all this a reality. So with that broader context, 1 Peter in mind, Turn with me to chapter 2 and let's read the first half of verse 9 and start to see the answer to the question, what is the church? What does it mean to be part of the church? 
It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So notice first off that Peter calls us a chosen race. And Peter is drawing this phrase from the Old Testament. And this type of terminology was used to describe why God chose Israel, the nation of Israel, as opposed to one of the thousands of other nations that were on the planet at that time. For example, listen as I read from Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. In Deuteronomy it says, For you, Israel, are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you, Israel, were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the promise that he swore to your fathers. So in this Deuteronomy passage, God wants to make it clear to Israel that they are not a people who merited his mercy. It was actually quite the opposite for Israel. If they were to be ranked according to the simple assessments of, let's say, the worthy nation's rating system, they would actually be on the bottom, as the text says. Yet, God says to Israel that I loved you, the unlovely, the fewest of all peoples, to show the world how lovely I am as God. And in the same way, we as believers in Jesus are called a chosen race, unlovely yet loved by God, unworthy yet given honor by God, deserving of condemnation, yet we've been showered with this privileged status through Jesus Christ. And some of you, for various reasons, may have a certain theological allergic reaction when someone uses a word like chosen or elect. But let me remind you and remind all of us that God put this word in the Bible for glorious reasons. It's in the Bible to foster humility in us and ignite worship. And how does it do this? By reminding us that we did not first love God, but God first loved us. It reminds us that the only thing we added to the work of redemption was the sin that made it necessary. I hope that however you parse out the details of theology and things like election, regardless of how you get there, that when you get to the end, and when you get to heaven, you can look back on your life before and after salvation and say with true passion in your heart, to God alone be the glory, great things he has done. So Peter initially answers the question, who is the church? By showing us that the church is a chosen race, a community of unlovely, unworthy, condemnable sinners who have been forgiven, loved, and honored by God through Jesus Christ. So let's move to the second part in our text where Peter calls us collectively as the church a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. And just like the first term, this also comes right out of the Old Testament. In Exodus 19, 5 through 6, God relays to the Israelites whom he has just redeemed from slavery to Egypt what his purpose for them was. And his purpose for Israel after he redeemed them was that all of Israel would be like a royal priesthood in service to him. And just by way of an overview, the Old Testament priests had three main roles and functions in the Old Testament. First, to be a priest meant that you had special access to God's presence in the temple and the tabernacle. And also as a priest, you had the unique privileges of overseeing the sacrificial system. And on top of that, not only did you have special access to God's presence and you oversaw the sacrificial system, but you as a priest had the responsibility to instruct God's people in what it meant to honor God and obey his law. And in applying this term, of royal priesthood to us as the church. Peter is saying that we carry on these tasks, these tasks of the Old Testament priesthood, in a new way. And it's important to recognize that Peter is saying that everyone who is a part of the church is a part of this royal priesthood. This isn't only for scholars or professionally trained pastors or super spiritual Sunday school leaders. It's for everyone who is part of the church. We all serve in the royal priesthood under King Jesus. And as part of this royal priesthood, we all have special access to God through Christ. We don't have to go through a human priest. We don't have to visit a temple. We can go directly to God 
through Jesus, all of us. And also, as part of this royal priesthood, we all, in a way, oversee a sacrificial system. But it's not the one of the Old Testament. It's the one of the New Testament. And listen to me read a couple verses that describe what it means to be priests serving in this new sacrificial system. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through Jesus, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You, the church, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So these verses show that the New Testament sacrificial system no longer includes sacrifices for atonement because that has clearly been made once for all by our great high priest Jesus. But as part of the royal priesthood, we're to offer up our whole selves and our entire lives as a sacrifice of praise and worship to God. And furthermore, as members of this new royal priesthood, like the Old Testament priests, we have the privilege and responsibility to know and make known God's word. Just as Old Testament priests had to be intricately familiar with God's word and had the responsibility to teach it, we also ought to pour over God's word with an insatiable thirst to know it. We also ought to take responsibility for the fact that in some form or fashion, we are all teachers of God's word, whether informally or formally, with a spouse, a neighbor, friend, coworker, To some degree or another, we are representatives of Christ and called to be teachers of his word. So a second answer to the question, what does it mean to be part of the church, is that we are a royal priesthood who have privileged access to God's special presence. We are to live lives of sacrificial worship. We have the privileged responsibility to know and make known God's word to others. So as we slowly inch our way through verse 9, Peter gives us a third answer to the question, who is the church? Notice he uses the phrase, holy nation. And hopefully you're seeing a pattern here because this, like the other two, comes directly from the Old Testament. And let me read Leviticus 20, 26 that describes what it meant for Israel to be a holy nation. Leviticus 20, 26 says to Israel, you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So for Israel to be a holy nation, it meant to reflect the holiness of their God, the one true God, by living differently than the nations who lived around them and worshiped thousands of other false gods. And that's what, when we just got through the preaching series on Deuteronomy that Todd went through, all those laws in the Old Testament weren't simply about being holy for holiness sake, weren't simply about being holy to impress other people. They had a specific purpose. Holiness The laws that call us to holiness, the commands that call us to holiness, are always about reflecting the holiness of God to an unholy world. Israel was meant to reflect God to the world so that they could get a picture of who their God was. And this is the same way Peter is using it in relation to us as the church. We exist to reflect the true God to a world that chases after a thousand false gods every day. Our holiness is not for the sake of impressing people with how pristine and clean we can be as if the church were a museum. Our holiness is meant to impress people with a God who can take very ordinary people. I don't know if you've seen yourselves lately, but you are very ordinary. And God has taken us and he's working on us. We're meant to impress people that God can take ordinary people, forgive them, and slowly shape them to look like Christ. So third answer to the question What does it mean to be a member of the church? It means that we are members of God's holy nation, called to live life in such a way that we reflect the holiness of God, imperfect though we do it. And now we come to the fourth and final phrase that Peter uses to define and describe the church. Peter says that we as a church are a people for God's own possession, God's special possession. Can you guess where this terminology comes from? Yes, Harry Potter. No, I'm just kidding. just want to see who's paying attention. Yes, this comes directly from the Old Testament. 
In the Old Testament, there's a phrase used often to describe Israel that parallels with this one, and it's treasured possession. And this is found in a number of places, one of which is Exodus 19.5, where God says to Israel, Now therefore, Israel, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession, my, my special possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. What God is relaying to Israel in Exodus 19.5 is that although he owns the whole earth, all the people are mine, which include every nation, he has chosen them as his very own. In some ways, this term, God's special possession, summarizes and clarifies the first three terms we just looked at. It shows that to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, means that God has taken us as his treasured and special possession. But this phrase not only summarizes who we are as the church, it reminds us whose we are as the church. In other words, it reminds us who we belong to as the church. We are a race chosen by God to live as his people. We are a royal priesthood selected by God to serve him in his kingdom. We are God's holy nation made holy by him live, to live lives that reflect him. You could say with the words from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 that we are not our own for we are God's treasured people who have been bought with a price through the blood of Christ. As we transition in the second half of verse 9, we see that all four of these profound statements, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession, flow into this statement, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we cannot miss a connection between these four phrases and this last part of verse 9 that I just read. We have to answer the schoolhouse rock question. Do you remember schoolhouse rock? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? The word that, or more clearly, in order that, signals to us that this privileged status we have as a chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, is for the purpose of proclaiming and spreading God's praise. To be God's people as a church means that we exist in order to spread God's praise and his glory. That you may proclaim his excellencies. Yet, if we're honest with ourselves, as God's people, as his church, sometimes we take our identity but miss our purpose. And we're not always faithful to this mission. And we tend to fall into one of two dangers which impede our full and, part and passionate participation. On the one hand, one of the dangers as Christians that we constantly face is the danger of being passive. The danger of being passive about God's purpose for us as a church. We sometimes walk through life giving little attention to God's kingdom, all the while frantically working to build our own. Yes, we may come to corporate worship regularly, and even the occasional potluck, but aren't we, just, aren't we just really keeping the seat warm and enjoying free food? Being part of the church means so much more than just attending services and events that take place in a physical building. As if being in a garage made you a car or walking into a fitness center gave you the same chiseled physique as I have. It's not that easy, folks. So on the one hand, we can be passive, but also on the other hand, as members of God's church, we also face the danger of being busy procrastinators. Busy procrastinators. What I mean by this phrase, busy procrastinators, is that we can so load up our individual schedules and lives and family calendars and even church calendars with activities and events that obstruct rather than promote our participation in God's purpose for his church. And there's nothing inherently wrong with busy lives and busy church calendars and programs and facilities and Bible studies and things like that. But we must constantly be assessing and evaluating our lives and the things we do inside the church by asking the question, are these things promoting the spread of God's praise and our participation in that mission? Or are they really just keeping us busy? And when we stop asking that question, we are on a slippery slope. So if passivity and busy procrastination are hindrances to joining in God's mission, what are the remedies? What are the remedies? And I want to offer four remedies that will help us individually and collectively re-engage ourselves with God's purpose to spread his praise. First, I believe that we need proper discipleship balance 
proper discipleship balance. And what I mean by this is that we as a church and as individuals are concerned with both reaching the lost and growing the reached. Or you could say it, as individuals, we should be passionate about evangelism and personal spiritual growth at the same time. Churches and individuals tend to fall off one side of the horse or the other. Either they become so focused on reaching the lost, or people become so focused on evangelism, that we end up having a bunch of malnourished believers who are still living off of a diet of baby formula. Or we can become so focused on growing the reach and spiritual growth that we end up functioning as a church like a gated community, protecting ourselves from unbelieving intruders who might mess things up for us. It should not be either or, but rather both and. As Dr. Luke has said so well, we as a church and individuals always need to be going deeper and reaching farther into the community. These twin tasks mutually benefit and feed one another. For example, as I see and discover things in God's word, I want to share them with others. And as I share them with others, I realize how much more I want to see. And then when I go back and see and discover, I want to share. And on and on it goes. We have to function that same way. So proper discipleship balance. Second, one of the remedies to help us participate in God's purpose is we need precision on the gospel. Precision on the gospel. And precision on the gospel means that we not only know it accurately, but we are constantly seeking to plumb its depths and know more of it. It's been said that the gospel is both a message simple enough for a child to understand and yet profound enough for a scholar to be perplexed by. And that's true. We should never be content with our current understanding of the glories of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Yet at the same time, we must always guard it from error and treat it like a precious jewel There's a temptation nowadays, and you see it in the church culture at Broad, to treat the gospel like children's Play-Doh, where we can shape it any way we want to fit the modern trends of culture. But the gospel is a jewel. And it's not our message. It's not our gospel. It's God's gospel. And we are merely called to be stewards of it, who are called to handle it accurately and share it to the world lavishly. So we need proper discipleship balance and precision on the gospel. Third, We need passion for the gospel. Precision and passion for the gospel must go hand in hand. I'm convinced that most of my lack of proclaiming God's praise is not due to inadequate methodology or outdated evangelistic tracts, but my lack comes from a lack of passion for Jesus, which also at times stems from a very surface knowledge of him and a lack of communion with him. I mean, think of this. Nobody has to train me and guilt me into talking about my wife and how blessed I am to be married to such a biblical babe. Nobody has to twist my arm to teach me three steps to share why I think I have the craziest, cutest child in the cosmos. Why is that? Why does no one have to do that for me? Because I am passionate about my wife and son. And catch this, true passion always goes public. It cannot be contained. It must spill over. As Christians, we should be the same way about Christ, filled with passion that spills out in public proclamation. Proper discipleship balance, precision on the gospel, passion for the gospel. And fourth, the remedy to help us participate in God's purpose is we need the participation of the whole body of Christ. Proclaiming and spreading God's praise is a calling on every member of the church. We need the head, the eyes, the nose, the hand, the feet, all to utilize their gift and perform their function if we're going to be effective as a church on God's mission. Outreach isn't just the paid pastor's position. Evangelism isn't just a few spiritual lay leaders' job, as if a couple people had enough time and talent to reach the neighbors and the nations for Christ. Every member of a church, it takes the whole church to minister to the world with the gospel. So we are a people created for the purpose of spreading God's praise. And we can better pursue this purpose by striking the balance of growing the reach and reaching the lost, cultivating a precision and passion for the gospel, and joining together as the whole body of Christ to be about this task. But we must not forget that who we are as a church 
And this mission we've been given is all a gracious and merciful gift from God through Christ. This is not our church. It's not my church. It's not Todd's church. It's nobody's church. We didn't create it. We didn't place ourselves in it. This is God's church. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is creating, building, shaping the church. God in his wisdom has masterminded an eternal plan that we are seeing unfold right before our eyes. And we as the church are an intricate part of that. I mean, think about it. The groom, Christ, is gathering his bride. And we're part of this. The father is adopting his once spiritually orphaned children. And we're a part of that. The spirit is raising to life those who were once dead in sin. And we get to be a part of that. We are the recipients and the participants in this inexhaustible, unsearchable plan of redemption. And notice in the second half of verse 9 that Peter shows us the first of three aspects of redemption that have made us part of Christ's church and his purpose. It says in the end of verse 9, we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Peter is using language of God's creating activity that's found in Genesis 1 to show us that just as God spoke light into pure darkness, so also God took us from pure spiritual darkness and placed us in his marvelous light. This darkness refers to the domain of sin and Satan that we as unbelievers were once fully immersed in, blind to the toxins that we were breathing in. And not only were we blind to the darkness we once lived in, but the Bible says in John 3.19 that we loved the darkness. We were Satan's robots in a way, following him wherever he led. And were it not for Christ, the darkness would have consumed us whole. Yet, as John 1.5 says, Christ came as a light shining into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome him. And then for those of us who are Christians, at some moment in our life, whether we remember the exact moment or not, the light of Christ cleared the blinding scales from our eyes and opened them up to the most beautiful sight our spiritual eyes had ever, ever laid a hold of, the glory of Jesus Christ himself. And this is what it means as a church to be called out of darkness into his marvelous light that those who were once in darkness under the reign of sin and Satan have been called out by Christ into his marvelous light. As we transition to verse 10, we see a second aspect of redemption that has brought us into existence as the church. Peter says to us, once you were not God's people, but now you are God's people. And this phrase, God's people, is used throughout the Old Testament to describe the status that Israel had as God's specially chosen people. No other nation had this special covenant relationship that God had with Israel. And all of us who are outside of Israel, what the Bible would call Gentiles, we were ignorant of God's saving promises. We were, we were without hope in the world. We had no hope for the future. We had no God, no true God. We didn't have the true God. But as Ephesians 2.13 declares, now in Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This change from not God's people to being God's people, what the Bible calls adoption, came at the cost of God's own son. Our adoption into God's family, the price for our adoption was not cheap. It was very costly. In Galatians 4, 4 through 6, Paul tells us that God gave Christ his only son as the payment to purchase us from our spiritual orphanage and bondage to sin. The son was forsaken by the father on our behalf so that we as sons could be brought in and hear the words, I will never leave you or forsake you, my children. So lastly, not only have we been called and adopted into this church, but in the second half of verse 10, Peter reminds us that we were a people who at one time not received mercy, but now in Christ we have received mercy. This phrase, no mercy, receive mercy, comes from Hosea chapter 2. In the first part of the book of Hosea, God has Hosea marry a prostitute, Gomer, who is unfaithful to him, commits adultery, in order to give him a picture, in order to give Israel a picture of how they had treated God and his relationship with them. And in this book of Hosea, Hosea has two children with his wife who's been unfaithful to him. 
And one of his children, he has to name no mercy. I mean, imagine if you were told to name your kid no mercy. And this was a sign to Israel of how God was going to punish Israel for their unfaithfulness. But Hosea chapter 2 ends with God promising Israel that one day he would have mercy on his people despite the fact that they had committed spiritual adultery against him. And in the same way, Peter relays to us through these words from Hosea chapter 2 that despite the fact that we have given our lives and our love to a thousand other things besides God, God doesn't look at us and hand us divorce papers. Rather, he, he holds out a ring and dresses us in robes of pure white. Despite our faithlessness to Christ, even after we come to Christ, he is merciful and faithful to us in a thousand ways that we can't even fathom. Our sin runs so deep, yet Christ still calls us his own and holds out new mercy to us every single morning. We are part of his church and participants in the spreading of his praise because he looked on us who had no mercy and he showed mercy to us in abundance. And to tie this together, the, the God who calls, who adopts, who shows mercy to the fact that we have this identity, we need to understand that the identity we have is true of us regardless of who we are and what we've done. That we have this identity not because of what we do or who we are, our gifts and talents, but because Christ earned the status for us and declares it over us. So whether you feel like a holy nation, look like a royal priesthood, it's true of you because Christ earned that status for you and he places you in his church. And so we as a church, a people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, are created for a purpose, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we've been a people created for this purpose by a person who has called us, adopted us, and shown mercy to those of us who didn't deserve us. And for those of you who are our part of this church, that's true, and you get to worship because of that fact. And for those of you who are here and visiting and are not a member of church, don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is what he holds out to you today as well. That he, he calls you, and he can call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That he adopts you. That you, have a, you can have a new father, a new family. And that he can show you mercy because Christ purchased mercy for you. Pray with me as we close. Heavenly Father, we don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve the grace and mercy you've shown us. Yet you call us your people, Lord. We as ordinary people have the extraordinary privilege to be part of your church that you're building, Lord. May we truly see this as your church. May we truly understand the magnitude of the grace that you've shown us. And may it foster humility and ignite worship in us and propel us to exist for the praise of your glory. That we would individually seek to worship you and that we would seek to spread your worship from shore to shore. And Lord, we long for the day when your glory covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.